Good morning, St. Andrew. It is great to see you here in worship. Welcome to St. Andrew. Welcome to worship on this second Sunday in the season of Easter. Whether you're joining us in person or joining us online this morning, we greet you with a warm and loving welcome. It is great to worship together. If you are here for the first time, I want to especially encourage you to stop by Cafe Connect outside in our atrium space, outside the doors of our sanctuary. At Cafe Connect, you'll get to know some folks that would love to get to know you and answer any questions that you might have. And as we gather today in this space, I remind all of us that St. Andrew is an open and affirming congregation. We welcome people from all walks of life, from families of all shapes and sizes, and people from every point along the spiritual journey. So whoever you are and whatever you believe, whether you believe anything at all, you are welcomed and affirmed in this space. As we like to say, you belong here, so welcome. Let's hear from Carly about what's happening in the life of St. Andrew this week. Good morning, St. Andrew. Please remember to put your cell phones on silent and to sign in today to let us know that you're worshiping with us. Have you seen the many ways to be involved at St. Andrew, even from afar this spring? Be sure to visit our website and to subscribe to our newsletters to learn how you can spring to life at St. Andrew. Did you know that the funds raised at our annual youth auction help to support our youth mission trips, our youth choir, and youth musical? Our online auction is currently open and it runs through the 21st, and our live in-person auction will be next Sunday, April 23rd at 3 p.m. Visit the website slash youth auction to learn more about how you can support our amazing youth program. Are you ready to take the next steps to membership at St. Andrew? Are you interested in learning more about this vibrant community? Join us next Sunday, April 23rd at 1145 in the library for a light lunch and informational session on life at St. Andrew. To learn more about our membership class, Exploring St. Andrew, visit the website slash explore. Do you enjoy handbells and other concerts? You are invited to hear our bell choirs for their spring concert on April 24th here in the sanctuary at 730. Please note that the concert is not tomorrow, it's the 24th. <laughs> to learn more about other concerts that we are hosting this month of April, please visit our website and the music page. St. Andrew, are you ready for our annual Big Serve? This is our outreach day that's all about loving others and serving our community. To see all the community partners and to register to serve for our Big Serve, visit the website slash Big Serve, and that is on May 6th. We are so glad that you are worshiping with us this morning. For those of you online, please take this time to sign in and to connect to each other using the chat feature. For those of you here in our sanctuary, please check that your cell phones are on silent, and then stand as you are able to greet those around you. Friends, please remain standing and join with me now in the call to worship found on our screen. Holy God, we gather as your people, searching for the sacred, longing to be known, and yearning for connection. With gratitude, seek deep, rejoice, and up as we lift our hearts and minds to the God. Let's remain standing and sing together. You're the resurrection that we've waited for. You buried the night and came with the morning. You're the king of heaven. Oh, 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 we 
will sing We will sing a new song Cause death is dead and gone with the winter We will sing a new song Dear ones, in 1 Thessalonians, the Apostle Paul reminds us to rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Let us now enter into a moment of prayer together, giving thanks for all that God has graciously provided and shared with us. To your children pray. Lord, send your spirit in this place. Lord, listen to your children pray. Send us love, send us power, send us grace. We come to you now in prayer, holy and wonderful God. We thank you for the mystery of creation, for the beauty that the eye can see, for the joy that the ear may hear, for the unknown that we cannot yet behold, filling the universe with wonder. 
and for the expansiveness of space that draws us beyond the definitions of ourselves. We thank you for setting us in communities, for families who nurture our becoming, for friends who love us by choice, for companions at work, for all who share our burdens and daily tasks. And we also thank you for the strangers who welcome us into their midst, for the people from other lands who call us to grow in our own understanding, and for children who lighten our moments with delight. We thank you for this day, for life, and for one more day to love, for new opportunities, and one more day to work for justice and peace. We thank you for neighbors and one more person to love and by whom to be loved. We thank you for your grace and for one more experience of your presence and for your promise to always be with us, to be our God now and always. Blessed are you, O God, who through Jesus the Christ and in community of the Holy Spirit gives us an inheritance that is imperishable and unfading now and forever. We lift our voices together, gathered here as this community, praying the words of Christ, the ones that have been shared across time and space, the ones Jesus taught us to pray, saying together, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we Friends, the spotlight today is actually on you. It's on the amazing volunteers who made last week's Easter celebration so very special for so many people. We had more than 2,600 people gather in our sanctuary and worship with us in person. And we had more than 3,300 people from all across the world join us for Easter online. With the help of our volunteers from setting up to cleaning up and all the ways that you served and welcomed in the in-between. It was an extraordinary experience of God's love and generous hospitality and grace felt deeply in community. Please hear now the spotlight which will highlight some of the events from the last week and encourage us for the years ahead. Hi, I'm Lexi. I'm Margo. And I'm Samantha. And And we're we're your communication team. Easter at St. Andrew was an extraordinary, uplifting experience. Hundreds of hours of preparations by hundreds of volunteers made this joyful Easter experience possible, and we thank you. From singers and musicians practicing since January to volunteers helping to decorate our worship space and feed our 174 musicians, to childcare, kids, and youth volunteers, to a large hospitality team that included greeters, ushers, and folks available to answer questions and provide guidance with a smile. It was an outstanding team effort. The youth led a meaningful sunrise service complete with inspirational music and messages as the sun came up. They gifted us by sharing their faith and lovely music. Their beautiful collaboration made the service exceptional for all. We are grateful for the volunteers who made Easter Sunday so special. St. Andrew, not only did we celebrate Easter well, but as a community, we took the time to learn and grow through Lent. 
and to lean into the suffering, uncertainty, and darkness of the first Easter. We experienced a contemplative Stations of the Cross art installation, a moving Holy Thursday service in remembrance of the Last Supper Jesus shared with his friends, a powerful Good Friday service where we evoked Jesus' unjust suffering and death on the cross, and a prayerful indoor labyrinth experience on Holy Saturday. We are thankful for the way St. Andrew volunteers and community made an intentional journey through Holy Week. As an Easter people, our work of loving our neighbors, welcoming the stranger, eradicating social isolation and injustice, and living God's grace in tangible ways is a daily way of life. The work has only just begun and we're grateful to be doing it in community with you, St. Andrew. Thank you, St. Andrew, for being such a welcome, opening, loving community of faith. You definitely shine on Easter, and we are so inspired and grateful for your support in making it all happen. This morning, as you give, you are invited to utilize the online giving platforms or the offering plates which will be passed among you. If you give online, we encourage you to drop a card um, in the offering plate, which can be found in front of the seat in, or behind the seat in front of you as a symbol of your online gift. We hope that you will continue to support the good work, the ministries happening here at St. Andrew because of you in these ways. Let us pray. Loving God, receive our offering and use it and us for the highest good. Amen.
For our introduction to the scripture this morning, we want to offer the idea that most scholars assume that Lamentations was composed shortly after the fall of Jerusalem at the hands of the Babylonians in 586 BCE when grief was still fresh. The book itself is a collection of highly stylized poems that stand in a long tradition of laments for fallen cities, dating back to the end of the third millennium during the age of the Sumerians. Despite the scholarly debate, the tradition that Jeremiah was the author of Lamentations is ancient and persistent. Reading Lamentations reveals deep grief, sorrow, and even complaint over the past events. And yet, as we shall hear today, embedded within the poetry of Lamentations is a call to radiant hope for the future and a steadfast assurance of God's mercy and compassion. Hear now the reading from Lamentations from the New Revised Standard Version, chapter 3, verses 22 and 23. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. That sends the reading. Friends, we have a special gift today. We welcome today uh, the Reverend Dr. Thomas J. Ord uh, as our guest speaker this morning. Uh, if you've been around St. Andrew long enough, you know my deep commitment to helping those who have been in the mainline tradition in particular to reimagine concepts of God that may no longer work for them and to introduce folks to a God in the Bible that maybe they've never met but has been there all along. I share a similar vision with Dr. Ord. We've been trained uh, from some of the same schools of thought under some of the same uh, theologians and influencers of the 20th century. Of course, Dr. Ord took it to the next level and uh, has uh, become, I think, one of the most influential theologians in this conversation about reimagining the God of the Bible and the God of our real lived experience. It is a real joy to welcome Tom to St. Andrew. Tom is currently leading a doctoral program with Northwind Theological Seminary. He's also the director of the Center for Open and Relational Theology. He's written over 30 books and articles over the last several years and is cranking out about a book every year now. And we have many of those books for sale today if you'd like to know more. Maybe most importantly, uh, Tom is, uh, uh, is married and a father uh, of three uh, grown daughters. I like to think of Tom as a theologian of love and divine love, and I think you'll hear that today. Would you please welcome Dr. Thomas Ord. Thank you, Pastor Mark. Uh, yes, I'm a, a theologian, which in one sense, if you think about God, think about the divine, 
you're a theologian, so we're probably all theologians in this room. But in another sense, people actually pay me <laughs> to think about God and help them think about God. Uh, but it does make for some strange conversations at parties and coffee shops. And they say, now, what do you do? And I say, well, I'm a theologian. And like, usually the next question is, uh, so what have you been watching on Netflix lately? You know? <laughs> Change the subject as quickly as possible. I once had one person ask me, is that a metal band? And I'm like, yeah, that's my person. I used to be in a metal band 30 years ago, back when I had actual hair. Actually, Mason's sitting on the back. Mason, will you stand up a second? Now, there's some hair like a good metal hair. Put it out there, Mason, yeah. I wasn't quite that long, but uh, those were good days. Now, these are bald days. Theology, though, also sometimes sparks people to take a different tack. When they hear that I'm a theologian, it's almost as if they believe this is their opportunity to set me straight when it comes to God. You know, like, I've got the answer and now I have someone who's telling other people what God's about, so let me tell them what it's all about. Those people are interesting because, oh well, I won't go into the details of what kind of people they are, but today I want to talk about these views of God and begin with Ahmed. Ahmed found out I was a theologian and then sort of shifted into, well, I'm going to tell you the truth about God and began to list the divine attributes. He said, God is timeless, omnipotent, indestructible, impassable, immutable, independent, impenetrable. And I'm like, whoa. He said, God is outside of all time and space, has no needs whatsoever, and I was thinking to myself as he was talking, you know, I happen to know lots of other famous theologians in history who've, who've had that similar vision of God. But I said, um, now tell me, does this timeless and independent God, does this God actually love? And he said, oh, yes, God loves, but it's a different kind of love than you and I know. It's a category beyond all categories. It's a mystery. It's not like our love in any sense whatsoever. And I'm thinking to myself, you know, how is it that you seem to be really confident that God is timeless, omnipotent, and et cetera, but when it comes to love, it's like, pull out that mystery card. I don't really know. I said to him, you know, I'm the kind of person that when it comes to God, I start with love and then try to figure out the other aspects of God in light of love. He reminded me of another one person. Oh, I forgot to put, again, forgot to put the uh, little, this guy, Ahmed, thinks God has no needs whatsoever and exists outside of time, timeless. Another person I want to talk about, his name is Margie. Margie also, when she found out that I was a theologian, decided she needed to unload all of her views about God, except in her case, she believes God is mad really mad at you and me and all of the world, but especially about America. Everything that's bad that's happening right now, she says, is God's punishment. The pandemic, that was God. She also believes that you and I are going to hell when we die because you and I have sinned and God is pissed at us. And you know where we go if God's mad at you, H-E double toothpick. Well, I heard her talking, and I said, what happened to the idea that God is forgiving? Does that sort of fit into your scheme at all? She said, well, God forgives the just, but punishes the unjust. And I thought for a moment, I said, well, if a person is just or righteous, what is there to forgive? I said, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. Is anybody righteous? She says, no. None of us. I said, okay, so in other words, God never forgives because none of us are righteous. I said, does that make any sense to you at all? I mean, what about the God of the Bible, who is a forgiving God, who doesn't repay evil with evil, but repays evil with good? She looked at me a moment, and then as if she didn't even hear the question, she said, 
God hates gays. And I'm like, okay, this is a person who probably isn't going to have a good rational conversation with me. And I kind of just moved it on to Netflix or whatever it was. <laughs> Not metal, I don't think. But uh, So in her view, God loves the faithful, but if you're unfaithful, you get punished. We're all unfaithful, so we're all getting punished now and in the afterlife. These kinds of people are hard for me to talk to, i got to admit. But there's another kind of person who has a view of God that I don't find appealing, but I think comes to it more honestly and is more tentative, and I think I sympathize more with. And we'll let Karen represent this person. Karen is a person who uh, is really concerned and empathetic toward those who have been abused. She herself has been sexually abused, and she works with other people who have endured abuse. And when she talked about her struggles and thinking about a God of love, she said, I don't think God causes evil in the world. I don't think God causes abuse, but God allows it. God permits it. God has the kind of power to stop it, but for some reason, some inscrutable divine plan, some, something that I don't understand, God has allowed what happened to me and so many others. I looked at her and said something that many of you may find shocking, but I'm just going to put it right on the table. I said, what if a loving God can't prevent evil single-handedly? Now, some people, when I say that line to God can't prevent evil single-handedly, you can see them like the, the steam starts coming off their head and they're like, get thee behind me, Satan, you know. But for her, it was like a light came on in her eyes. All of a sudden, here was a view of God who is not only not in control, but this God didn't allow the horrific things she and other people endure as if God could have stopped it. For her, this was good news. Good news, because that meant that God wasn't culpable, not morally responsible for the pain and suffering she had gone through and so many others. This particular view of God that I want to uh, talk about that are represented by these three people, a God who has no needs and exists outside of time, a God who loves the faithful but punishes the unfaithful, and a God who causes or permits evil and suffering, kind of represent a general picture of God that I don't find attractive. And this morning, what I would like to do, since I'm a theologian, and since Mark and I have had some great conversations, and I'm guessing some of what I'm about to say you've heard before, and maybe some of it's new, but I'd like to compare and contrast two different views. One view I want to call the conventional view of God, the traditional view, and here I'm going to mix and match and put things together in a way. I'm, I'm not going to go into lots of hairy details. I'm just going to sort of present a, a broad picture of this conventional view. And then on the other side, I want to talk about what I'm going to call an open or an open and relational view of God and let you see the two ways of thinking about God and, and present the one I find preferable. Now, let me say right up front, God didn't download this sermon into my head last night as if this is all straight from heaven and I've got everything figured out and I'm absolutely certain that this is the right view. I'm not that kind of person. I don't come to you as if I know it all. However, I do come to you believing that some ideas do seem to work better than others. Some seem to fit scripture, at least the general drift of scripture better. Some seem to fit science and our personal experience and wisdom better. And so I want to propose a way of thinking about God, not enforce it or force it on you, and let you try it on for size, all right? So let's look at 10 aspects or details 
of this conventional view of God. The first one I mentioned already that maybe one that a lot of you haven't thought about is the idea that God is outside of time or timeless. This is a very common view in the Christian tradition. If you look at some of the major theologians, if there's any theology nerds in the crowd, people like Thomas Aquinas, Augustine, John Calvin, Martin Luther, they all sought God somehow was outside of time and saw all history in one glance, knew the beginning and the end all together. In fact, Augustine, the most influential theologian who didn't write the Bible, thought God created time. There's one aspect of that traditional view. Whoops, excuse me. Another aspect is this, this God is omnipotent. This God is in control. Now, when theologians say this, or when people who aren't theologians, probably people you see here in Denver area, say God is in control, they seem to forget the possibility that there also might be such a thing as free will and people making real choices. Does it make any sense at all to think that God controls everything, but that we also have free will? I don't think so, but a lot of theologians have said yes. In some mysterious way, they said, God is omnipotently in control, but you and I have genuine free will. Now, a part of the Methodist tradition, most of you probably know, our tradition doesn't think that. We're Wesleyans who think that we have free choices when it comes, and God preveniently offers through grace these choices. But the classic tradition has said, nope, God is omnipotently in control. This tradition also says some people get to go to the good place and the rest of you are headed to H-E double toothpick. Heaven and hell. Some have thought, well, from all eternity, God selected some of you to go to the heaven and some of you to go to hell. Others thought, well, God knew who was going to go to heaven and knew who was going to go to hell, but your free choices put you there. Either way, in this particular tradition, not everybody gets to go to heaven or even has the real opportunity, if we understand God's omnipotence and foreknowledge well. This tradition says only the elect, God's chosen, get to enjoy salvation. It also says God may or may not forgive. You need to ask. You need to get down on your knees, pray super hard, maybe 37 times, beg and plead, and then God might relent. But maybe not, too. You've got to catch God on a good day, especially if you're not among the elect. This God may decide to give grace, as the common saying goes, but also may decide to get out the big stick and teach you a lesson. This God also is the kind of God who actually primarily loves God's self. I know this one might sound really weird to you all, but let me explain it. This is what Augustine thought. He reasoned like this. God is smart. So far I'm on board with him. God is smart. God loves or values only which is that which is supremely valuable. And God is supremely valuable. So God only loves God's self, the ultimate narcissist. Now that just doesn't fit with the way I read the scriptures. It doesn't fit with the first verse I ever memorized as a little boy. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. That sounds an awful lot like God loves us. But that traditional God who only wants to love and contemplate the most valuable, ultimately only loves and contemplates God's self. Another aspect of this God. This God either is the cause of the pandemic, all wars, all torture, all abuse, or this God could stop them, but chooses to permit them, to allow them. 
this God has the kind of controlling power to up and fix the pandemic as quickly as it started, but decided to let things play out, have some people die and get sick, you know, wait it out, see where the course went. Does that make sense to you? It doesn't to me, but maybe you'll see my alternative in a moment. This God is also self-sufficient in every sense possible. This God doesn't need you or me for anything. God can get the job done all alone. Our lives, our contributions don't ultimately matter. Oh, maybe God will invite us to do something, but if we fail, God's going to get the job done no matter what we do. This God has no needs at all. Now, at first, that sounds kind of good to some people. But when you start thinking about it, it kind of starts sounding weird. Imagine you decide to partner with someone for a lifetime in marriage. And your partner says to you, yes, I would like to get married to you. But let me tell you right up front, I don't need you at all. And in fact, nothing you do is ever going to affect me or how I think. I'm guessing most of you would think that the person who said that is unhealthy. Like there's a healthy sense of dependence, a healthy sense of need. But the God described in conventional theology, no needs whatsoever. This God also has decided from all eternity everything that's going to happen, including the fact that today in this service, Tom is going to awkwardly stand with his hand up to his left in front of you. That was decided from all eternity. Every good thing and every bad thing that's ever happened is a part of this God's divine blueprint. It's all determined. This God also will occasionally intervene into a situation. Maybe jump in and rescue a child who's about ready to drown. But not always. It's just on occasion. Which means all the other kids who do drown, you're thinking, okay, what happened here? If God can help out one person and intervene to save the day, why doesn't God help out everybody? This God is supernaturally interventionist into the world. Not always present. Most of the time, kind of sitting up on Mars, eating popcorn, saying, Good luck, St. Andrews down there. I might show up on Sunday morning if you pray hard enough and if Mark preaches well. But most of the time, this God is aloof. This God also, and finally, doesn't really love consistently. This God is the God described in Scripture that says, Jacob I have loved and Esau I have hated. This is a God who loves some people sometimes, if they're good, but maybe not all people all the time. Inconsistent loving. Now, those are the characteristics of this conventional view. And again, I'm kind of throwing lots of ideas together here. If we were to look at really nerdy and go down to individual people, they might, we might take a few in and out here and there. But that's a general view. And I'd like to see, as a raise of hands, if how many people here have heard people describe God in one of those kind of ways. Does that sound familiar? Okay, yeah. So you know what I'm talking about. This isn't new ideas. In fact, if you're like me, you may have one time embraced some of those ideas. I used to think some of those. Now I want to present to you an open and relational view of God. This is the one I prefer. I'm not absolutely certain it's true, but I want to offer it to you as a possibility. First of all, unlike the God who's outside of time, this God is moving through time with us moment by moment. The past is past for us and for God. The future is open and yet to be determined for us and for God. Sounds remarkably like the God usually described by the biblical writers, in my view. This guy, God also can't control others. Not because God's a weakling or a wimp or a wussy. This God can't control because this God is loving. And loving is not controlling. 
Yes, powerful, but not controlling kind of power. A persuasive, calling, empowering, inspiring kind of power. This God wants everyone to have eternal life. Everyone to flourish. All people and all creation. Now and in the future to find full salvation. This is not a pick and choose, you're in and you're out. Everybody, ollie ollie in, come free. This God is also a God who's going to forgive you no matter what. Never going to retaliate. Never going to pick up the stick and whack you in the butt. This God is a God who forgives from the get-go. Now, there are some natural negative consequences that come when we harm one another. But those aren't God with the big stick. That's just part of living in a world in which choosing something that's harmful is harmful. That's not God. This God is also one who loves you and me and all of creation and loves God's self. Did this kind of surprise you? Were you thinking as I compared the two, that it would be God loves God's self over there and over here it would be God loves us and doesn't love God's self. Actually, I think God loves us, all creation, and God's self. And that's important if we're going to actually take seriously the Apostle Paul's charge that you and I ought to imitate God because that means we love others, creation, and ourselves. There's a healthy healthy sense of self-love. God does it perfectly. You and I want to imitate that self-love. This open and relational God can't stop evil single-handedly. Now, I know this is a troubling issue for some of you because you think to yourself, it would sure be a lot more comforting if I knew God could stop the bad things that happen in my life and me with him. I mean, if God could stop Putin right now, wouldn't that be more comforting? But if that's the case, God's asleep on the job, right? If God can up and single-handedly stop the evil in the world and doesn't do it, what kind of parent is that? What kind of parent allows their kids to hurt each other? I'm coming to you today from the great state of Idaho. And behind my house in Idaho, there's a pretty significant stream. It's probably, oh, 30 or maybe 40 feet wide, maybe three feet deep at its deepest. And I have three daughters. Imagine my three daughters out in the stream some hot summer day playing, and I'm out in the backyard doing work. And imagine that one of my daughters, let's make it my oldest daughter, Sydney. Sydney gets angry at my youngest daughter, Andy and takes her head, puts it under the water, sits on her head, and decides to try to drown her, to try to kill her. She's that mad. Now suppose I'm in the yard, I look up, I see what's going on, I realize I could inch her out into the stream and rescue my youngest daughter, but suppose I say, you know, I'm not causing this death. Who am I to interrupt the free will of my oldest daughter I'll just allow, I'll just permit one kid to kill the other. No one in my subdivision would vote me father of the year. Because we all know that a loving person, if it's possible, if they're able to prevent genuine evil, does so. And yet most people I know believe in God, but think that God sometimes allows or permits the horrific things that happen. What if, what if God's love is such that God can't single-handedly stop evil? That's the proposal that I want to suggest this morning. Also, what if God wants love to win, but is calling upon you and me and all of creation to join in the work of love? What if, and this is another thing that might sound really unsettling to some of you, what if 
love can't win in its fullest if we don't cooperate. What if God needs us? Needs us in the sense not to exist. God's going to always exist. But needs us in the sense of the mission of love in the world. That you and I, our choices really matter. That's what the open relational perspective says. And what if this God has some general plans, but doesn't determine the blueprint? In other words, this God isn't just winging it, like, well, whatever. This God is guiding, calling, luring, wooing us. But God isn't determining all of our responses, because we have freedom, and so does creation. What if this God is always present to us at all times and all places? This God never leaves us for, or forsakes us, to quote the scripture. In fact, this God empathizes us, with us when we suffer, actually feels the pain and suffering with us when we endure it. And what if, finally, the God that that actually exists, the open relational God, always loves. 24-7. Humans, other creatures, worms, quarks, those aliens that I know are out there somewhere. What if God loves everything and everyone at all times and relentlessly? That's the vision of God I find compelling. And that vision, I think, helps us to try to give a real strong response, a, a plausible, a reasonable, even a biblical response to the kinds of questions and issues that we looked at earlier. That is, when we look at someone like Karen here, who asks the question of God's love in the face of abuse, we can say to Karen, God isn't punishing you, that this pain isn't somehow part of God's plan. God is working with you, loving you, calling you and everyone else to love, but simply can't prevent single-handedly what you endure. I got a letter from a woman three years ago. We don't have any kids in here, do we? Um, I got a letter about, from a woman about three years ago. She sent and said, I just read your book, God's Plan. Um, I was sexually abused by my brother when I was young. And she said, one time she had a dream. And in this dream, Jesus came to her while she was being abused and held her hand. She said for a couple of days, she felt relieved, like Jesus was with her in the midst of her suffering. But then she realized... This Jesus in the dream was there and didn't stop what her brother was doing. And she gave up on belief in God. She said, there's no way I'm going to believe in a God who is there in the moment, has the power to prevent what's happening, but allows it. When she read God's plan, she said, now it makes sense. I can believe in a God of love who does the utmost possible moment by moment for what's good, but can't stop free will creatures from using their free will wrongly. That God makes sense to me. And that makes sense to Karen. This is also a God who's not punishing people, not sending people to hell, calling all people at all times and all places. A God who forgives. And a God who, in response to Ahmed, is actually someone whose existence and activity makes our lives meaningful. Do you realize that if God is omnipotently in control, and the end is already secured and determined and final and fixed, that means what you and I do doesn't really matter. Our lives are insignificant. But if God woos us, loves us, calls us, invites us, needs us, then all of a sudden the choices we make actually make an ultimate difference. And I find that profoundly more compelling.
So that's the view I want to suggest to you today. A view I call open and relational theology. I don't know for sure that it's true. I'd like to say that every single passage in the entire Bible perfectly points to this view, but I've read the Bible. And the Bible's got a mixed message. I think the majority points to this view. I think the revelation we find in Jesus points to this view, but I've read the Bible, and there's some tough passages there. Let's just admit it. However, even though I'm not certain that this is the accurate view of God, I'm actually trying to live my life day by day, moment by moment, as if it's true. And my invitation to you all this morning is to consider the possibility that you also live as if there's a loving, open, relational, uncontrolling God at work in your lives and all the world. Havoc in the evening, sirens in the morning, peace by the afternoon. I was planning on leaving, unless you really need me. I'm just trying to keep up with you. Here in my wildest dreams, we are the only ones awake. The memories start. fade away, the memories start, and you call my name, golden, golden light, golden, golden In a treacherous life, there's breath on the glass, but death on the vine. Havoc in the evening, silence in the morning. How is it so loud when it's quiet? Here in my wildest dreams, we are the only ones awake. The memories stop, and you call. fade away memories stop and you call my name going going light going going light going going light going going you stand with us as we sing our closing hymn this morning? ground. 
singing that with Taylor. You may. You make beautiful things. You make beautiful things out of the dust. And you make beautiful things. You make beautiful things out of us. Friends, I want to invite you immediately after our service to join us in Fellowship Hall. Uh, Tom and I will have a conversation in Fellowship Hall. It will be a light lunch served by our United Women of Faith. A good opportunity for you to bring some of your good questions and engage with us in this ongoing conversation. With that said, let's join together in our benediction on the screen. We go now to bless the world, to sustain the weary with a word of hope, to draw neighbors and strangers into the refuge of grace, and to bear the love of Christ in every place at all times for all God's people. Amen. Peace. Mm -hmm.